Well, growing up on a dairy farm, I spent many a summer day with my dad and brothers uh, baling hay, hauling, and unloading hay bales. Now, the least enjoyable part of this summertime process, at least for me, was being a, uh, the person who was assigned uh, to be in the hay barn near the end of the summer when the barn was mostly full of bales. As those final bales of the season made their way up the elevator to the window high up in our tin uh, barn, uh, hay barn, someone had to be up there to meet those incoming bales and quickly throw them into the remaining few open spaces in the barn. And that someone was often me. Conditions inside our nearly full hay barn in August were extremely hot and dusty with no air movement whatsoever. And so in between bales uh, or loads of, of hay bales, it was a must, an absolute must, to, to, to get outside for a, a brief moment, get some fresh air, run to the milk barn, grab the ladle that was hanging over the metal sink in our milk barn, and fill up on some ice cold water drawn from our 160-foot deep well on our farm. Now, whether one is working in a hot, stuffy hay barn or pouring hot blacktop on a road construction crew on a hot summer day, when your body is overheated, icy cold water is the taste of pure heaven. But as, just as I love ice water on a hot, hot day, I equally loved piping hot coffee at the start of any day. I like cold, my cold drinks cold, I like my hot drinks hot. And that's kind of been a standard joke in our family as well. Lukewarm beverages just do not seem to cut it for me. Now I know musicians will tell me, hey, it's much better to have lukewarm water when you're up singing than ice cold water. That's probably true. It just doesn't cut it for me. Today, we visit a church that had some temperature issues of their own. They were lukewarm, and Jesus tells them that their lukewarmness was simply not acceptable. In his letter to them, we find a challenging and a relevant message for our lives and for our church. So join me as we pay a visit to the first century church in the ancient city of Laodicea. Now, Laodicea was located in the Lycus River Valley of Asia Minor, about 10 miles west of Colossae, 6 miles south of Hierapolis, and 100 miles east of Ephesus. By the first century AD, it was the wealthiest city in the province of Phrygia. Now, not only was Laodicea a center for banking in the first century, but it also had a thriving textile industry, primarily that of of turning black wool into uh, garments. And it had a famous medical school. Yeah, Mayo wasn't the first. It had a famous medical school that produced a well-known eye salve for which people came from all over the Mediterranean world. The principal deities that were worshipped in Laodicea were Zeus, the king of the gods, and a god, local god known as Menkaru, the Phrygian god of healing and the patron of the city's medical school. But Laodicea also had temples to numerous other Greco-Roman gods and goddesses as well. And there was also a sizable Jewish community in the city of Laodicea and the surrounding region of Phrygia. Now the gospel of Christ likely came to this reason, uh, region from best we can tell. Uh, through the Apostle Paul's ministry colleague Epaphras, who was mentioned a few places in the New Testament. The biggest problem facing the city of Laodicea was its water supply, and it did not have a good source of water. And I'm going to say more about this in a few minutes. The city had a second problem, and that is it was earthquake prone. You've heard a few other cities in this series that were affected by earthquakes. Uh, that region is a very volatile region, is to this day, as this map shows, there are three tectonic plates that converge in what is now the nation of Turkey, then Asia Minor, and that often results in, in earthquakes in that area. Laodicea, as a city, was virtually destroyed by a massive earthquake in AD 60. 
But rather than be dependent upon financial assistance from the Roman imperial government, as nearby Sardis was, we heard about that uh, before, Laodicea proudly financed its own rebuilding effort. It had the financial wealth to do it themselves, and they were proud to say no to Roman help. All in all, Laodicea was an affluent and self-sufficient city. With that, let's see what Jesus has to say to the church in the city of Laodicea. As we have seen in all six previous letters in this series, this letter begins with a command to write. A command from Jesus to John, the Apostle John, to write this letter and to send it off to the church, in this case, Laodicea. This command is followed by a description of Jesus, a self-description uh, of Jesus to this given church. Jesus says, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Here Jesus offers a three-part uh, self-description. First, he calls himself the Amen. Now, most of us are accustomed to saying that word at the end of our prayers, and we do that as children long before we even know what the word means. But it literally means verily, or truly, or so be it. Saying amen denotes accepting as true the preceding message or the preceding prayer, meaning we really mean this. So, too, Jesus is the affirmation, the affirmation of God's truth. And he is about to speak that truth to the way of the seen church. Next, Jesus refers to himself as the faithful and true witness. Now, this second emphasis upon Jesus' faithfulness is likely an intentional point of contrast with the lay of the sea and church's unfaithful witness, as we will soon see. Jesus speaks to the lay of the sea and church as the truthful, as the authoritative witness. God. And third, Jesus refers to himself as the ruler of God's creation. Now the Greek word that's translated ruler here is the word arche. It, it often is translated with the word beginning in English, as in John 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word, and so forth. It can also mean the origin or the source of something, such as the originator of creation. And sometimes it is translated as ruler, uh, as the NIV translators chose to do here in this passage. Jesus is the originator of all creation, as well as creation's rightful ruler. And as such, he's basically telling the church, I have all the credentials I need, and then some, to assess your church. After Jesus' self-description, we are accustomed to reading his words of commendation or affirmation of the church to whom he's writing. In most of these letters, that's what comes next. However, there is a glaring absence of any affirmation of this church in Laodicea. There's none. None whatsoever. Like he said to previous churches, though, Jesus says, I know your deeds. I know your deeds, your actions, your works. But in this case, their actions leave them, sadly, with no reason to affirm them. No reason. Rather, Jesus offers them a word of rebuke. Listen to the first part of that rebuke. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I, I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Wow. Those are words that no Christian or church ever wants to hear from our Lord. Here we see this church's temperature problem, a spiritual temperature problem. But to understand their spiritual problem, we've, we need to first understand the problem that the city of Laodicea had with its actual water. I alluded to that before. Now let me explain that. You see, Laodicea, for all of its wealth, for all of the good things that the city had going, it had no good source of water of its own. Ironically, the city of Colossae, located just 10 miles to the east of Laodicea, had plentiful amounts of cold, pure drinking water from the mountaintops. And just six miles north of Laodicea, in the city of Hierapolis, 
They had mineral hot springs that were famous for their healing power, and people just loved to go there and sit in the hot springs. But then there was Laodicea, sandwiched in this, tri this triad of cities, which lacked its own source of either hot water for bathing or cold water for drinking. And so Laodicea got a bunch of Roman engineers together and they made a plan to fix their water problem. They built an aqueduct to bring water from the hot springs six miles south to their city. But by the time that water traveled those six miles to Laodicea, it was no longer hot. It was tepid. Not to mention it was contaminated by all the minerals from those hot springs. And by the time the icy cold water arrived from Colossae, it had warmed up on its way so that it also arrived lukewarm. Cold source, hot source, meat in the middle, lukewarm, either way. So despite Laodicea's otherwise wealthy, comfortable conditions as a city, this water problem that they had as a city was a constant irritation for its residents. It's amazing how much of these aqueducts still remain today. Well, playing off this local dilemma, Jesus tells the church in Laodicea, I wish you were either one or the other. I wish you were either hot or cold. In other words, if you were one or the other, you would be useful. You would be desirable. But you're neither one. Because you are lukewarm, you, you annoy me. You annoy me to the point that I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. We are left to fill in the blanks a bit as to why the Laodicean church was so spiritually lukewarm in the eyes of its Lord. Were they indifferent to the things of eternal value? Did they refuse to take a stand uh, for truth when it conflicted with popular opinion in their community? Were they so smug and self-satisfied that they had lost their dependence upon Christ? Or had they become such a spiritual country club that they had lost sight of their mission to their community and therefore they no longer offered anything of, of real spiritual value to their neighbors? Whatever the specifics were, they, their spiritual zeal was clearly lacking. They were lukewarm. And Jesus found that to be nauseating. Nauseating enough to spit them up. <laughs> well, this reminds me that churches that lack spiritual fervency are nauseating to the Lord of the church. That's a hard truth. We don't really like to hear such a bold statement as that, but how else can we interpret what Jesus says here? Even as Christians, we can be permissive about our own lack of spiritual fervency. God loves me. I'm saved. God will forgive me. Those things are all true, but we can turn those gracious gifts of God into excuses for becoming spiritually lazy, negligent, passive, and lukewarm, just like the land is the injured. So let us remember that the receiving eternal life by faith in Christ, is, that's not the end goal. We haven't, with that, arrived. It's the starting point. It's the starting gate. God has so much more in store for us, for every follower of his, and for, for every church that belongs to him. So much more. So let us continue to pursue Christ, to pursue his mission for his church, with faith, with energy, and with our full devotion. The second part of Jesus' rebuke sheds light a little bit on what was so nauseating to him. He says in verse 17, You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Again, remember that Laodicea had, had, de had declined imperial assistance in the rebuilding of their city following the, the earthquake in AD 60. The city was, was proud. 
The city was self-sufficient. And like its city, the church in Laodicea had, had begun to see itself as rich and as prosperous and in need of nothing. They were self-sufficient. They were content with who they were. That was their internal assessment. But Jesus conducts an external assessment of this church. As he looked in at this church, what he saw was vastly different from how this church viewed itself in the mirror. They saw themselves as rich, as prosperous, as, as needing nothing, but Jesus calls them wretched, pitiable, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. And so to my friends, our own self-assessment may not always match the Lord's assessment of us. It's just a reminder to stay humble. Uh, through my work with our denomination's vitality ministry, I have seen again and again how common it is for churches to see themselves through rose-colored glasses human nature, I guess. But such resistance to the truth about their current reality only leads to, to continued weakening of whatever energy that church still possesses. But in the end, in the end, the only assessment of any given church that ultimately matters is the assessment that Jesus makes of that church. For his assessment is flawless. It's perfect. It sees all. Only his assessment of, of whether they are, are being the people that Jesus has called them to be and whether they are doing the work that Jesus has called that church to do, only his assessment of those things will ultimately matter. A church, any church, can frankly ignore Jesus' assessment. We can ignore Jesus' assessment for a while, for a while. But as this series of Jesus' letters to the seven churches has shown us, if, if a church faces the truth about itself and truly humbles itself before the Lord and chooses obedience, Jesus will pour out his blessing on that church's ministry. He will pour out his blessing now and into eternity. But if a church receives the truth, yet chooses not to follow it, Jesus reserves the right to withdraw his blessing and even to shut down that ministry. So friends, let us keep our eyes on Jesus, the Lord of the church. Let us be honest about ourselves, gracious to one another, but honest about ourselves. And let us be quick to repent, quick to obey the will and the mission of our Lord Jesus. Before we move on from Jesus' assessment of the Laodicean church, let me point out something else we see in them. You see, the Laodicean church was materially rich. And yet when it came to spiritual riches, they were very poor. And this is a reminder that material wealth and comfort can sometimes foster spiritual complacency and self-reliance. Perhaps the American church needs to hear that more than any other place in the world. Jesus warned in his earthly ministry repeatedly about the seductive nature of wealth. He didn't say it's sinful, but he said in different words, it's seductive, so beware. He said a person cannot serve both God and mammon or materialism. And he freely shared how difficult it is for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. Now this begs the, the question of all of us, whether we see ourselves as rich or not, and that is, how does our current level of wealth affect our spiritual desires? How does our current level of wealth affect our spiritual desires? 
And does our material wealth and comfort placate and blind us from discovering true and lasting riches in Christ? Does our, does our material comfort keep us from pursuing deeper faith and greater spiritual maturity? People tend to often be the least self-aware when it, when it comes to seeing the depth of our own materialism. And that's partly why Jesus warned against it. So what is God's an antidote to being consumed by materialism? There's probably multiple parts to that answer, but let me focus on one, and that is to give. To give. To give away our money. To give generously to the work of the Lord, to give generously to the poor and to the needy in our world and all around us. And so one of the best ways to know if you are spiritually lukewarm or not is to take an honest look at your finances and to answer two basic questions. Number one, what percentage of what you earn or have do you give away? What percentage do you give away? And second, how much joy do you experience in being generous? How much joy does that bring to you? I promise you this, if you are a joyfully generous person in regard to the work of the Lord and to those in need, I highly doubt that you are spiritually the Lord. I highly doubt. Well, speaking of wealth, notice Jesus' word of exhortation to the Laodicean church. He says in verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. You see, there was a gold that Jesus wanted this church to have, a gold refined in the fire. And the gold that he's referring to here would make them rich in the proper way. Laodicea, as I mentioned, was a regional banking center in first century Asia Minor, but the gold that Jesus speaks of here was not the shiny metal kind. They had plenty of that. What they needed was spiritual gold spiritual treasure, a kind of treasure that they could only get from Jesus himself. In fact, the words refined in the fire may even be a reference to the spiritual maturity that comes only by way of enduring trials and hardship for the sake of Christ. Besides spiritual wealth, Jesus says they needed white clothes to wear. I don't think he was addressing a physically naked congregation. This is a spiritual kind of clothing as well. A reference to purity, holiness, and righteousness that's found throughout the book of Revelation. The fact that Jesus describes this church as naked indicates that their, their holiness, their purity, were lacking in his eyes. And despite living in a city with a famous medical school and a popular eye salve, Jesus invites them to buy salve to put on their eyes, to buy it from him so that they could see. In other words, he invites them to exchange their, their spiritual blindness for a fresh encounter with the truth, the truth that he was offering. With that exhortation to come and to get these things from, that, from him, Jesus then gives them a warning. He says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Now, any loving parent can readily identify with Jesus' words. For when our children are young and they do what is wrong, our love for them motivates us as parents to initiate corrective action. We've all been there as parents. And Jesus does the same with us, with his followers, and he does the same with his churches. Out of his love for us, he rebukes us when we go astray. 
and he disciplines us when we persist in going astray. Why? So that we would choose the better path. So that we would choose the path of love and faith and obedience to him. God's discipline is always motivated by his desire to bring his people back to him. Back into loving fellowship with him, the shepherd of the church. And so the principle we see here is this. Errant followers of Jesus can choose between repentance and discipline. Repentance or discipline. Door number one is, is repentance. That is a, a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of attitude that leads to a change of behavior on our part. That leads us to, to realigning ourselves with God's will for our lives. That's repentance. Door number two is discipline. Because if we choose not to repent of our sin, then God reserves the right to discipline us, to bring us back to where he wants us to be. And Jesus, the Lord of the church, will discipline us if we choose to continually ignore his invitation to repent of our sin. He will, because he loves us. Well, if discipline was the stick, the promise he now gives them was the carrot. For as we have seen in previous letters, Jesus offers a promise to overcomers, a promise to those who do choose to faithfully follow him. The first promise is seen in verse 20. There Jesus says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and, and eat with that person and then with me. I, I know it's popular uh, for us to use this verse in evangelism, you know. Jesus knocking at the door of an unbeliever's heart. Just put your faith in him. Accept him as Savior. Invite him into your life. I, I've used that verse in that way as well. But, but notice that Jesus uses this, these words in a different context, he uses them here in speaking to the church in Laodicea. The Laodicean church was so rich, so complacent, so self-satisfied, they didn't even notice that Jesus, their Lord, was outside. That's sad. And yet there he stood, knocking, knocking at their door, longing for his church to truly welcome him back into their life back into their fellowship. Table fellowship was reserved for intimate friends in the ancient world. It was also used as a way of, uh, of signifying reconciliation between two parties. The image Jesus conveys here shows the, the depth of his desire to forgive and to reconcile his wayward church in Laodicea. If they would just open the door of their lives and their communal life to him, they could still experience rich, rich fellowship with their Savior. And so too, Jesus patiently yearns for us to fully open our lives to him. To fully open that door to him. He yearns for us to, to remove the walls, to, to unlock the locks to the private parts of our life. He yearns for us to stop keeping him at a distance, to stop trying to do church by our own strength, our own wisdom, our own ideas. Friends, which side of the door is Jesus at in your life? Which side of the door? Is he, is he kept outside, just outside, near enough where, where you could invite him in if and when you want to do that and feel the need, yet far enough away that you have full mastery of your own life, full mastery of your own house? Or is he inside, seated at the table with you, where you share intimate spiritual fellowship with him each and every day. Is that where 
Jesus is in your life. She's the second promise to the faithful followers of seen in verse 21. He says to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me, not just at the table, but on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Here, Jesus promises faithful followers that, that they will one day reign with Christ. Sharing in, in, in his victory and in the authority that he will have in his coming kingdom. And once again, we see Jesus' sincere desire to, to share that glory with his beloved. To share it. Just as the Father has Jesus at his side, Jesus says to faithful followers, Come, sit with me on my throne. So this promise is for us as well. If we follow him faithfully, one day we will reign with him in his kingdom. What an honor. What a privilege. What a gift that Jesus offers us. Well, for the seventh and last time in this seven-part series, Jesus' letter ends with a summons to hear. To the readers then and now, Jesus says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Plural. In other words, listen up. Listen up. To Christ followers everywhere, Jesus says, this message to Laodicea is also for you, for your church, for your life. The bottom line message of this letter is this. Jesus rebukes his church for its pathetic self-sufficiency and he exhorts them to repent and to open their hearts to him for restored fellowship and to share in his victory and authority. That's what Jesus says to the church in Laodicea. That is also his timeless message to churches everywhere. I have two closing questions for us to reflect on today and this week. The first is this. What is your spiritual temperature? Not what's your high point been in your life, but what is your, your spiritual temperature right now? The church in Laodicea was spiritually tepid, lukewarm, too warm to want to drink, too cool to want to bathe in. Jesus says to them, get your act together. Get your spiritual temperature set where it ought to be. Decide to be useful to me in one way or another, be it hot or cold. Give me a reason to use you. Friends, what's your spiritual temperature? Second, is the door to your life fully open to Jesus? Is it fully open? What a sad picture this is of Jesus standing outside one of his churches, knocking, 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 waiting for them to invite him into their life and their fellowship. What about the door to your life, to your heart, to your values, to your lifestyle? Is Jesus waiting, knocking, for you to fully embrace him, to fully welcome him in? And if he is, why are you waiting? Why would you ever wait one more moment? Don't open that door. And with that, we conclude our journey through Jesus' letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Real churches, in real cities, in real time in history. Churches to whom Jesus revealed himself in majesty and glory. Showing himself, showing himself to be the great God in human flesh. 
churches with strengths and weaknesses and opportunities. God's people whom Jesus affirmed, rebuked, exhorted, and sometimes warned. And churches that he offered some awesome promises that will be eternal in life. Each of those churches, however, had to decide how they would respond to Jesus' message to them. And so too do we, both individually and collectively. Jesus' words to these seven churches is his word to us as well today. How will we respond? How will we respond? the messages that we found in these seven letters. My prayer, my hope, is that we will respond with worship of our Lord Jesus. With worship of who He is. That we will respond with repentance. That whatever sin lurks in our lives, individually, whatever sin we have put up with in our church that holds back his mission among us, that we will repent. That we will respond with love. Love for our Lord Jesus who loves us beyond description. Love for the mission that he's given to us. Love for one another. Love for our community. In our world. My prayer is that we will respond with obedience. That we will read these words and we will keep reading these words to the seven churches and we will see Jesus' commands and we will say, Here am I, send me. Or, Here am I, Lord, I will do as you say. My prayer is that we will respond with faith. That we will not trust in our riches. We will not trust in our own wisdom or ideas or preferences or heritage or community perspectives or anything else anywhere near what we will trust in Jesus. That we will put our faith in Him. That we will believe that He has good in store for our lives, for our families, for this church, for this community, through God's people. And we will trust Him, whether we face persecution in the years ahead, or whether we continue to be free to exercise our faith, but whatever the external circumstances would be, that we will live by faith in Jesus Christ. Pray that we will respond with hope. Because every seven of these letters ends with a promise that Jesus makes to his church. You see, when you read the back of the book, when we read the back of the book of Revelation, guess what? We win. We win. Because Christ has already won the victory. And therefore, we win when we are with him, and so we can be people of hope. Oh, our world needs hope. God's people, you and me, are to be those people of hope in this world, pointing others to the ultimate source of that hope, which is Jesus Christ. This is my prayer for my life, for yours, for ours. Lord of the church, we humbly come before you as your daughters and sons who are saved only by your grace. Only by our faith in Jesus, your Son, not because of any works we have done. We come to you acknowledging that we often go astray. We might call it big ways or small ways, but anytime we go astray, we are, we are losing out on 
the kind of fellowship and blessing in our lives that you have in store for us and you call us to repent, to turn, to get back on track with you, to come alongside you in this journey and to follow the faith and obedience. So Father, would you instill within each one of us the sincere desire to be your disciple, to, to make Jesus Lord of our lives and Lord of this church in such a way that we follow expectantly and enthusiastically and hopefully and obediently that we will be the people that you called us to be, that we will do the work that you called us to do, and that we'll see you pour out more blessings upon us than we could ever have imagined because that's what you love to do. Father, do your perfect work within us. And thank you for being so gracious to forgive us when we sin and we confess that sin to you. Thank you, oh God, oh gracious God. So set us free from the sins of the past. Set us free from small-minded thinking. Set us free from selfishness and parochialism and division and greed and, and self-sufficiency and anything else that stands between us and where you want us to be. Oh God, have your perfect way in my life, in the life of each person sitting, seated in this room or watching this via live stream, everyone who's part of this congregation, Lord, have your way with our lives. May we be the church that says, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We will follow you.